It's Torres. Victor. That's okay. Don't let me disturb you, Victor. We I think we're good to go. I'm supposed to do it. It's on the list. Do you want me to do it? Yeah. Okay, welcome back. Uh, I'm Russ again, and it's a pleasure to see you back. I trust you enjoyed lunch and had some nice discussions about this morning's panels and, and presentations, which were very provocative. Uh, one item of housekeeping, a couple folks came up to us after the last panel and uh, commented that some people would like to make a comment, not necessarily have a question. We kind of noticed that. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're receptive to comments, but we ask that if you have a comment or a question, please make it brief and on point, just out of courtesy to your fellow conference attendees that we give every, as many people as possible a chance to speak. So uh, Victor's written this long thing for me about these past panels, but I don't think I'm going to go through that. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, Victor. Anyhow, and uh, get right to the fact that we have a distinguished panel here this afternoon right after lunch that's going to talk about robotics. Is that correct? correct. And uh, Jim Bellingham from Mumbari, which I trust you all know what those initials stand for, is our moderator, and uh, Jim has promised me he will introduce his fellow panelists as the panel goes along. Jim, the floor is yours, and we're looking for a very lively discussion. Terrific. Well, thank you, and uh, it's a tough act to follow there, a number of really interesting uh, panels in the morning, uh, but I think we have a great group here, and so let me just sort of uh, first very quickly introduce folks, uh, and then we're going to jump into some discussion on, uh, on various aspects of robotics, how do you do it, uh, what's coming next, uh, how do you get it out, and we'll have 20 minutes at the end like the other groups did for, for question and answer. So uh, uh, Michael Klagas, I met actually when he was still at uh, AVI, uh, at the Alfred Wegener Institute. Uh, he has a lot of experience actually uh, in the Arctic and operating <laughs> under ice. Uh, and is now at the U University of Gothenburg in, in Sweden and is in the process of actually uh, uh, doing something which uh, uh, is very, uh, very closely tuned to this meeting, which is setting up an oceanographic uh, organization there, worrying about ships and assets and what he's going to have. So uh, Vincent has been in the engineering side of this for a very long time. I certainly have known him since uh, I think the late 80s. Uh, and he has uh, done human-occupied vehicles, ROVs, AUVs, uh, the engineering side, the AI side, uh, the research side, and the operations side. And so we're really lucky, uh, lucky to have him here. Um, uh, uh, Michael Taylor is, actually comes to us from industry. So we have an industry representative. Uh, she actually has robotics experience from NASA. Uh, from uh, Heartland Robotics, which is uh, Rodney Brooks's uh, latest company and is currently at Bluefin. Uh, the three, by the way, on the far right are all jet lag because they're all here from Europe, so, 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 so go easy on them. Or actually maybe probe them harder, I don't know, you know <laughs> one or the other. And Henrik Schmidt is here from MIT, and Henrik has been involved in this AUV business uh, since, the, uh, since the early 90s. I, yeah, I did. I get him, got him into it, and uh, he's been uh, getting me back ever since. Uh, Henrik actually is an acoustician uh, and has done an awful lot of work actually with the Navy on some fairly sophisticated systems, uh, both predicting and uh, understanding sound propagation under uh, underwater. So, with uh, without further ado, I think maybe I'll jump into uh, our first slide, if you don't mind. Uh, and uh, I guess we've got it up there already, and uh, uh, ask uh, Vincent maybe if he can tell us a little bit about, we all recognize that getting technology, building technology is hard, inventing things is hard, getting it out there and actually working is maybe the most challenging. So tell us what are some of the strategies that, that work for you as you, as you sort of move through this, uh, this uh, 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 a range of vehicles that you have up there. I'm not sure it's a real strategy, <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I will try. Uh, so in this picture, uh, you, you have um, a full taxonomy of the kind of robots you, we can use for underwater intervention. Uh, so a key word for me is biodiversity of robots. As you can see, you have small robots, big robots, uh, 
you might occupy the icon in this, in this slide. And uh, the choice of uh, one technology or the other technology is a complex uh, is a complex process because it starts by, in general, a request from a scientist and then uh, a lot of exchange with a technologist. And in this case, we have a, a chance to have a success. When it starts by a request from a technologist, you are sure at the end it will be a, a mess for us. I am in a strange position because I'm doing R&D, as you say, in robotics. I'm doing engineering to build operational systems. And also, I'm doing operation. So my clients is science. It's good. And my duty is operation. It's good also, but it's a duty. And to close this loop, uh, I think in the, the, the reality of the process and the success of the process, getting your robots involved in oceanography, is in the perception of this loop. Uh, you need to have added value for science, even you don't need to have these robots. And the added value is, uh, uh, is something which is clearly defined by the scientist. Why we use robots? Why, and this, uh, this picture is also uh, uh, presenting HOV. We start with HOV. We still operate HOV for different kind of reasons. But uh, the, the, the process of, uh, do, of uh, involving robots for our, our science is mainly uh, related to impossible mission with the other systems in general. We, we have new robots because we, need, we have new problems. And there is another story which is uh, related to the op operational side, which is the cost. If we have robots, it's because at the end, it's, more, it's less expensive than the other solutions. So I can describe for each kind of systems why we use AUVs, why we use gliders, why we use HROV, why we use hybrid AUV, uh, hybrid ROV, etc., etc. Each time, it's a question of scientific request, and at the end, a question of operational cost. So that's the process uh, which led us, led us to uh, uh, the development of such technologies, both sides. So, so Michael, you, you're, you're in the process of actually thinking about what you're going to equip your organization with. How do you look at this? Uh, do, you, do you sort of anticipate that you're going to have to use any particular strategies to introduce new capabilities, or do you see sort of rapid and excited uptake of these things? Well, <clears throat> what you're talking about is, a, is an application we have submitted recently to the to a private foundation in Sweden, which uh, is a major funder for um, infrastructure of national importance in Sweden. They, it's the Wallenberg Foundation in Sweden. <clears throat> and we applied for an AUV, which is non-existing at the moment in Sweden, uh, at least not in the private sector. We don't know exactly what the Navy in Sweden and for complementary systems for our ROVs we have at this Sven Levin Center for Marine Sciences. And uh, the, the intention to apply for this AOV is merely driven by scientific interest. There is a lot of scientists working at Gothenburg University and other Swedish universities which have a strong interest in using these instruments, particularly in, the, in, the, in polar regions. That is the main driving force for this application. And as you know, I have some, some background experience from my former work at the Alfred Wigner Institute in, in Germany, where we invested almost 10 years ago in an, in an AUV for under ice missions. And uh, I have to calm down the expectation in Sweden a little, because my saying always is, having an AOV is one thing, to get it operational is a totally different one. Um, and they all expect the first mission will be under the shelf ice in the Antarctic. I said, never. <laughs> we, have to, we have to go step by step. That's about the strategy. <laughs> that's, a, that's a strategy. It sounds like. so. So, so uh, from from the, from the industry side, you know, what kind of what's your sp perspective? Uh, uh, how do you see these systems uh, 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 being picked up? Why do why where are people interested in technologies and why? Well, I think everybody is interested in technology. I think the the bigger issue, of course, is is the um, funding side of it. And I think there's some interesting new kind of business models that could come out of serving some communities that maybe have um, you know different financial considerations than others. Um, I also think there's starting to be a bit more kind of segmentation of the different markets, uh, from the academic and scientific world uh, to the commercial oil, gas, mining industry, and of course the military. Um, that while each one can leverage the developments of the other sectors, uh, 
the needs are really starting to change. And so if you look at sort of the robotics industry as a whole, it's kind of um, impossible to say, oh, I'm going to start a robotics company. Well, what does that mean? There's quite a lot of sectors within robotics. Which one are you talking about? Um, I think maybe the AEV industry is going the same direction. You know, as, as the needs of the science community mature, uh, they're going to be uh, buying, building completely different types of AUVs um, than the ones that the oil and gas industry are buying or that the military are buying. Right now, I think there's a lot of commonality between all those three, but I think that's just going to increasingly diverge over the coming years. So Henrik, uh, having, having been working with this technology for 25 years or so, uh, you know, kind of what are your perspectives on, you know, you've had to convince program managers that this stuff was going to work and well, then explain to them why it sort of 80% worked. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that this, is, this is a very important question. It's been touched upon also this, uh, in this morning's uh, panels, is uh, what, what will it take to ta have the scientific community really adopt this technology? And I really think it comes, and that's the approach that we've been taking, and uh, we're, we're going to talk a little more about that later on with another slide. But the approach we've taken is to really involve the user, and I'm a user. I'm, uh, when I started working with Jim, uh, I, was doing under, I was doing underwater acoustics in the Arctic. And uh, the Navy, which paid for what we were doing, they would give us everything except they were not going to give us any data about what the underside of the ice looked like. So Jim and I got together and we had an AUV then uh, go down and, uh, and we didn't make much measurement of the ice thickness, but it was the first step in, in approaching that. And um, since then, then we start, we, Jim and I worked to, uh, together then for, uh, for years on this, and uh, we were involved in some uh, very interesting experiments where we really were developing, developing the vehicle integrated with the sensor. And we were not, there we are not talking about uh, putting a sensor on an established platform, as some of these are. The, the, mo the, most people having a, using AUVs nowadays, you, uh, they go buy an AUV or they lease an AUV, and then they put a, you put a sensor on it, you work with the, uh, the vehicle manufacturer on, on actually operating the vehicle, you use their software. What we are doing instead is we, we say, okay, we would, we would like to be able to do a particular measurement in the ocean. In my case, it's an acoustic measurement. I need to have direct control of the vehicle itself. I need, as a chief scientist, being on board that underwater vehicle, being cloned on that vehicle, uh, and I have to work directly with the captain of the ship uh, in achieving the objectives I want to do. So I really think that that is the way forward, uh, is to really involve the end user, the scientist, in the development of the vehicle, not just using the vehicle platform. So I think that's the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually, let's let's talk a little bit then about how this evolves. You know, kind of where we go next. Uh, you know, perhaps the state of the art today uh, mostly revolves around survey vehicles. Uh, you know, mapping the seafloor, mapping the upper water column. Uh, maybe endurances are increasing. The number of uh, sensors that we have available to put on it are increasing. But uh, you know, surely we're going to have a significant change, right, in the type of platforms. And so I think we have a slide here, which, uh, which if they can queue up, uh, we'll let uh, uh, um, um, that Michael talk to. <laughs> so, uh, so, because I think what we want to do is talk a little bit about what are the kind of the crazy possibilities for the future. So what are the technical possibilities here? And then we can match them against what perhaps the scientific needs might be. Mm. We are waiting. <laughs> There but this go. is, um, first of all, I have to give credit to colleagues at the German Center for Artificial Intelligence and, and Robotics, which uh, made this uh, short animation about future perspectives in underwater robotics. And, and they have established a branch, this, this uh, Center for uh, Artificial Intelligence and Robotics, 10 years ago in Bremen. They had some other ones uh, elsewhere in Germany. And they are well experienced in, uh, in terrestrial and extraterrestrial and aerial robotics. And they told me this is, this is technology which is almost major. We will have this in, in, in a very short time. So this was 10 years ago. It is not existing yet. So my, 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 my clue out of this is uh, either they, they underestimated the problem in the ocean uh, environment, or it's uh, still not that major, this technology. I, I mean, this will be the future of, of seafloor observatories, of uh, undersea uh, or subsea constructions, and uh, the underwater navigation will certainly benefit from having fixed 
point locations at the seafloor for better underwater navigation and, 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 and the performance of these systems. I'm pretty much uh, sure, I, I'm, I'm sure that this kind of, of technology will evolve. Um, it all depends on, first of all, of course, the industrial interest in this kind of, of technology and this kind of systems. And second, the scientific questions to be addressed using these instruments. And that is something which has been raised in the previous panel. I think that we really need to fill the gap between engineering sciences and the end users of these systems. I have seen too many examples where engineers have developed uh, temperature probes, for instance, measuring at an accuracy of a millionth of a centigrade, uh, uh, and no, no end users there having any, any application for this kind of highly sophisticated temperature probe. So we need more, and this was what... You, you promised me you weren't going to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> this was a stop or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, the, this hovering uh, AUV and the other robots, that means pairwise or, or swarm robots, which do pre-programmed missions together and communicating with, with each other. These, these underwater systems, these cable observatories, you don't have to tell me that is, is already existing. But uh, this kind of, of operation uh, where robots are communicating and doing uh, uh, jobs like social insects, jointly together, that is the next step for these underwater systems. So Vincent, you've been working on uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, intervention. I think the, one of the key for robotics is uh, the definition of a task. Uh -huh. Considering the task complexity, you have a different design. In this case, you are talking about intervention AUV, for example. Uh -huh. So we have experience in intervention AUVs. Ten years ago, we have built two intervention AUVs, and we demonstrate the feasibility of intervention AUVs. Uh -huh. It was Swimmer and a live project. Uh -huh. So we make some docking, we make some telemanipulation with AUVs, is, so it's feasible from a technical point of view, a pure technical point of view. But we were not ready for the market, and since 10 years, with the support of a French oil company Total, we get this uh, process alive, but we are in the death valley, not the death valley, the death valley. Death valley. So uh, it's typical for technology, the death valley. Yeah. And there is a notion which is TRL. So the TRL of this technology is about six, seven, perhaps. To go to nine, it's not only a question of, te of technology. It's also a question of needs and a, que a question of uh, definition of a task and uh, a, que a question of requests. So, so, so what, do you, what do you see? I mean, when, if, uh, if this one, is, the need hasn't emerged for it yet, where do you see the need emerging? I think so. I think we're not so far. The technology is ready for this kind of task. Uh -huh. it's, it's feasible, but what, where is the gain uh -huh. compared to uh, using an ROV? Uh, it's the problem of the intervention a, uh, uh, AUV. Mm -hmm. When we launched the intervention AUV programs, the idea was to, to say no ship. Mm -hmm. But in the oil uh, field, the oil companies say, okay, I just invest on my ship mm -hmm. with ROV. So mm -hmm. it will take 20 years before my assets mm -hmm. will be down. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to, to change a model because uh, the robots is linked to the ship, mm -hmm. and the ship is the cost of the ship is much more than the robots. Mm -hmm. So ROV is nice because you have a ship already, and you have a ship for 20 years. So to invest in a new technology to do the same job as you are doing with an, an ROV, with an AUV which will be uh, less uh, flexible, in fact. Come on, you guys are uh, dancing around the point here. So the, question, the real question is, what, you know, what is the next big change, right? So what do you have, what are you working on in the back room that you're not telling us about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I have the operation, you know, on my uh -huh. side, on my duty, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for me, reduction of cost and reduction of ship, doing okay. what we are doing with big ship, with smaller ship, is the key, and this has an impact on the, AU, on the ROV or AUV design. Mm -hmm. So at this stage, we are developing a new H ROV system, which is a class two ROV, uh -huh. and the idea is to deploy a class two ROV up to 3,000 meters depth mm -hmm. with a non-DP ship, small ship. Mm. So it's the same job as an, a classical ROV, but with a, a non-DP ship. And, and, this and tell us what, why, why, why should, why is this an important goal? Because to to have more access uh, to the sea, mm -hmm. uh, with the same level of money, average of money we have for science, mm -hmm. we need to be innovative and to propose innovative solutions to increase the utility and the rate of usage of the robots themselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this lets you go and operate a deep ROV off a fishing boat? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, do you have any, uh, any insights here? Um, to some extent, yeah, I, I, but I think it's a it's a difficult question for an AEV manufacturer to answer because um, I think uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not passing the buck here. I promise. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I'm I'm here because I'm a robotics geek. Um, I I grew up in the the donut hole we discussed earlier of Ohio, where I didn't even see the ocean until I was 13. I am at Bluefin because I love robots. Um, and it's been a real shift for me uh, working at Bluefin and then talking to users like yourselves to realize that nobody really cares about my robots, right? You care about the sensors I put on them and the data that those sensors collect. And that's really depressing kind of early on. So, so <laughs> but, but the reason I say, therefore, that, that, Jim, your question is hard for an EV manufacturer to answer, you know, we are fighting our own battles in the robotics world, in robotics technology that nobody here cares about, only we care about because we're building the truck to drive around the sensors that you're working on. So there's a whole list of things we're working on in that realm um, that, that are maybe, uh, you know, transparent to all of you. Um, in terms of the sort of user applications, I think, um, you know, the thing we ask, that we hear about the most is usually endurance. That seems to be the, the big, the, the visions for the future of AUV applications are um, long, -term, long endurance, um, kind of persistent networks of AUVs um, and things like that. And that's, that's certainly a major challenge. It's a challenge in every technology industry right now, right? Battery and, and power in general is a real challenge. It's no different with AUVs. Henrik? Uh, well, to continue along the same line, uh, the, uh, the, there's another way of, uh, in addition to power uh, to get persistence, and that's intelligent con-ops. Uh, you can have, if you, uh, if, uh, if you, for instance, are doing event, de event detection, you can have a, uh, a vehicle with a, uh, uh, with a simple buoyancy control that can, uh, uh, can sit and drift at constant depth. Uh, it can even, uh, you can even move up and down and following currents that are stratified in the ocean without using any power. Then when the event happens, you have the power available for, uh, for moving. And I think those are the kind of, of intelligent concepts uh, that, uh, that you can, we, can, we can start thinking about putting. And actually, you are putting, people are put, starting to put into these, uh, these vehicles. But in terms of the, of the question uh, of, uh, uh, of the role of AUVs uh, versus the role of ROVs, uh, I, I really don't think it's an, it's an either or. Uh, the, uh, there are things where the ROV is, uh, is definitely more useful uh, because you directly have the operator in the loop, uh, which you don't have a possibility of having with the, uh, with the AUV. On the other hand, in terms we talked about, uh, about deploying the deployment in infrastructure, um, we de we, uh, we've deployed uh, uh, a few weeks ago a, a 6,000 meter the vehicle uh, AUV from uh, uh, from a, uh, a 40 40 foot uh, uh, research, uh, not even research vessel but basically a support vessel. Um, you don't need that infrastructure. All you need to be able to put a modem over the side of the of the ship and drop the vehicle in the water with the A-frame or the crane, and off you go. Uh, so you can go to sea the day after you decide there's something happening out there and uh, and do that. So I I think I, I think they, there's there's pros and cons of both. But uh, I think the AUV technology really is is really opening up a lot of possibilities. So, so let's, uh, let's actually switch gears a little bit. These vehicles don't exist in a vacuum. You already alluded to this a little bit in earlier conversations. Uh, the people, uh, you know, the people who build them are, are changing, right? I mean, it's a different group of people building robotics now than were, uh, you know, several decades ago. And it's a different group of scientists and postdocs who are coming through the pipeline. So we could have the next slide here. Um, and we heard a little bit of discussion about this earlier. Tell us a little bit about the, the Boston First competition and what's going on here. Where, who, how do you attract these, these kids? Are they all paid to be there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not even the Bluefin engineers in that picture are paid to be there. Um, so let me talk a little bit uh, to start about the First competition in general. Uh, first stands for, for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. And this um, was a program started by Dean Kamen of um, iBot Wheelchair and Segway and other technology fame. Um, in order to encourage uh, the next generation of STEM uh, uh, people. And um, it's, a, it's a, normally a nationwide program. It is technically international now with um, quite a few teams in, in other countries. Uh, but, but what you're seeing in this, in this slide is um, the high school team for the first robotics competition that is sponsored by my company, Bluefin Robotics. Um, and this is a, the high school in Quincy, Massachusetts. Um, these kids are, you know, between 13 and 18 years old. Um, some of them come in knowing absolutely nothing. Some come in having been taught to program by one of their parents from a young age. Uh, but by the end of the program, what they know about is um, 
they know soldering, they know wiring, they know uh, a little bit of programming, they know how to machine basic things, use basic tools, basic safety around all of these things. Uh, they can do a very basic electrical design on, on battery powered systems, and they know about robots. Um, I'm a huge fan of this program because I would not be here if not for this program. I was on a team in high school. I've continued volunteering ever since, and I ran the Boston First Regional Competition for, for quite a few years. Um, it's a program that really does change lives, and this has been around since about 1993. They've done um, studies of the, of the alumni coming out of this program, and they're many times more likely to um, not only enter, but more importantly, to stay in STEM fields throughout their university careers and then into their actual um, industry or academic careers. Um, it's better, uh, they get much better numbers from minorities and women who go through this program as well. So programs like this, programs like many of the others, you know, science fair competitions, uh, there's the mate, uh, ROV competition, things like that are becoming really, really critical, um, not just to uh, uh, sort of inspiring the interest of these students who are going to be sitting here in, in 10 years, but also um, to kind of build up a lot of the skill sets that are important. You know, we're at a point now where, where students are coming uh, into college already having built a number of robots. Uh, they already know about PID control. They already know about basic sensors. Um, so imagine what they know by the time they get into industry, right? They're starting from a different different spot, and I think we're going to see the, the effects of that in the industry fairly quickly here. So, so let, me, let me turn to you, Henrik. Uh, you, you know, you get a, a new postdoc in your lab. Uh, they're an acoustician. Uh, you know, how do they bridge into this? What, 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 is, what, is, what, is, uh, what do you do to prepare them for this? Well, yeah, for, first of all, one of my, my current grad students was, the, uh, um, was the, uh, the lead on the Cornell winning team uh, two years in a row uh, in the AUV competition. <laughs> um, and uh, she's been a tremendous asset, actually, in that regard, because we, have a, uh, we currently have a uh, program that's funded by Patel. Um, it's called the Hunter Prey Competition. And uh, the idea is uh, to uh, have, an, as an alternative to the AUV competition, which really is focused on the hardware of building an AUV, uh, to instead have something that focuses on the software. So the idea is to have a worldwide competition run on the World Wide Web, where uh, kids all over the world, in China, wherever, can submit a software solution, an autonomy solution, to a, uh, a, a surface autonomous surface vehicle. Uh, and we have uh, several of them running in the, on the Charles River just outside MIT. And the idea is that they'll be able to download their software on our vehicles and actually run as part of the competition, even without showing up, being able to do that over the web. And I think it's the kind of thing that really is going to be, uh, that's, uh, is going to be exciting young people around the world and attracting them to, to not only the field of robotics, but also ocean science in, uh, in general. So. We look, we, we're having a lot of fun with that. Good. Michael? Well, um, just a brief story. In 1998, we got a very unique offer from Yves Vermeer. He is from this institute, using uh, the brand new ROV Victor 6000. It was a prototype system developed by Vincent and his team. And when we started to work with this for the first scientific mission on board our research icebreaker Polarstein in the Arctic. It was a unique opportunity for us, and we were deeply impressed about the f all the functions of this new robot for us. It was the first deep sea ROV ever used on a German research vessel. What we realized during that period that we were, still, we were a very close shop or club using these ROVs in the coming years too, because this system is, was so complex at that time that it needs really a lot of, of, of training and introduction into the functionality that it was restricted to, let's say, two or three handful of uh, senior scientists to work with this system. So we, of course, try to invite more and more other scientists to work also with the systems. <clears throat> but my, my take-home message out of this is, and Paul Falkowski mentioned this earlier this morning in his panel session, we, we don't teach instrumentation and we don't teach uh, ROV or AUV uh, uh, usage. We need lectures on how to use these systems uh, uh, in a most efficient way. Uh, we recently launched, an, uh, our colleagues of mine launched uh, an ROV teaching course at Gothenburg University in Sweden. And we had to cancel this because we had only two applications of students uh, joining this, this course. So for my take-home message out of this is 
I or we have to make more advertisement at our university in using the systems, but that there's definitely a need to train young people, students in using the systems to get the full potential out of these systems. Vincent? Um, my feeling is that the tool, the AUV, the ROVs are only tools. Uh, for the scientists, the more important points is the, the services get by the tool. Uh, I think the scientists are well trained in sensors, in sensor interpretation, uh, in navigation, this kind of thing. They, they, they are general physicians or this kind of thing. But the, to be able to, to know how to drive a system or how to design the system, I'm not sure it's very important. But by the end, I, I encourage the scientists to be trained with the system before they, get, they go in campaign, to, to gain time in campaign also, <laughs> and to have a more uh, precise uh, definition of, a, of, of, of the dives, of the missions. They, they, they need to be aware, but they don't need to be experts of the system themselves, because it's too, it's far away from their preoccupation. In our process, to, to build the campaigns, for example, the, the scientist has no choice. It could be uh, the ROV, it could be the managed submersible. It mm -hmm. depends the disponibility, it depends when it is, it depends where it is. But the sensor is the same. And for him, at the end, he needs to have a good interface. So here we, we come back to the standards. We, we spoke about standards this morning. A good interface. He needs to have a good positioning, good georeferencing. He needs to have good control, uh, quality control. But the, the driving of the vehicle itself, for him, it's uh, okay. I think it's a second order. Uh, interest. So to train the scientists uh, in technology in terms of uh, uh, standards and inter interface uh, quality, yeah, I think it's interesting. But to train guys on uh, how to drive a system, I'm not sure. So, so, so actually, the, this, this question, uh, um, a lot of these things you can tell we sort of had a chance to discuss beforehand, but let me drop one on you that I didn't before. We haven't mentioned UAVs. Uh, we haven't talked about surface craft. Uh, what do you all think? I mean, the one, surely that's one of the amazing developments that's occurred in the, you know, mo mostly, mostly from the outside, yeah. mostly not from the ocean sciences. Well, but if, if, if you want me to start? Uh, well, apparently. I, I do, you, you, <laughs> apparently, you didn't. You apparently, you didn't listen. I just talked about surface quest. Well, okay, true. Uh, the the uh, uh, as uh, our, our good friend uh, John Leonard calls them, uh, AUV, why a, a, AUVs with training wheels, uh, because they really are great for developing uh, developing some of these concepts. Uh, because uh, they, they it's, they're pretty forgiving. They don't dive into the bottom or, and uh, uh, and get lost. So I think they're. They, they, uh, but they also play a role as uh, sensor platforms, obviously, in uh, the hybrid system. Uh, I have one about this because uh, we recently tried to operate in, in a, uh, a wave glider, and the legal issue for us was a real problem to, to use this kind of UAV autonomously uh, in open sea. Uh, so each time the, 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 for us, the problem is legal issue, and we find a solution for the wave glider. We declare it as a virtual mooring. And it runs, so it's a, a new AV which is fixed, <laughs> because virtual mooring you can declare you, you, you have you have legal issue, and that's the main problem of this of this kind of technology. It's also the case for AUVs. Yeah, yeah. We have recently an, uh, an incident with an AUV coming back to the surface with no ship to to mm -hmm. welcome it, to welcome the, the AUVs in a, in an area which was a, not a clear area, and uh, again there, we have legal issue due to the, uh, the use of AUVs and a, uh, UAVs. Uh, USVs, yeah. USVs, sorry. Yep, yep, yep. yep. So, so, so uh, either of the Michaels want to? <laughs> well, uh, well I, I just thought it was funny that Henrik descri described USVs as uh, AVs with training wheels, because I was about to say that UAVs and USVs feel like cheating to me. I mean, you've got real-time communications and you've got constant GPS lock. That's, that's just too easy. Um, but, but, but easy is good, right? <laughs> uh, it's just no fun. Um, but, but I think they are going to start working in concert far more with AUVs, particularly as you look at things like communication relay buoys, you know, not just for long endurance AUVs, but when you've got a fleet of them um, and your ship perhaps is limited in the number of different uh, connections it can maintain to each of those AUVs. Uh, sort of the, these relays, these uh, navigation um, kind of... Uh, what do I want? A navigation relay, in a, in a sense. You know, that sort of thing is going to come into play uh, quite a bit. So, so it's great to have seen those be developed um, separately from AUVs because now we're able to leverage them so easily. From an from an end user perspective, I must say that 
um, having all these different kind of autonomous systems is, is kind of nice to have. Mm -hmm. But from an operational perspective, I think it's non-affordable for most universities or uh, smaller research institutions because you need to have an engineering department in the background, otherwise you, you will fail. You can't... That is, Hendrik, I, I, I told you, I'm a little bit provocative today because <laughs> I have not this engineering background as you all have. Uh, I'm an end user and I went through very deep valleys filled with tears in getting uh, an AOV operational. <laughs> Um, this needs more than just two people. You need really software engineers in having an ROV tool, and you need someone in hydraulics and mechanics. Uh, you really have to consider this seriously. If you invest in these robotic systems, uh, they solve a lot of problems. You can send them in really remote and, and exciting environments like the shelf excavations in the Antarctic and in Greenland. But you need qualified personnel which helps you out at sea because you as a biologist or as a chemist are often not in a, in a, in a position that you can repair or maintain any of these uh, sophisticated instruments uh, which the systems have nowadays, that's it. So, so, uh, so let's actually actually follow this, uh, this thread a little bit to our last topic, uh, is the last slide we have here. Uh, and uh, uh, don't worry, Henrik will make this all uh, uh, very simple, I'm sure. But uh, what we really want to talk about here is how do we use these systems? How do they change, uh, how do they change our facilities? Uh, do they become part of our labs? How do we get this technology out? How does it manifest itself? And how does it, how does it change, perhaps, the facilities we have? So, Henrik? Yeah, first of all, uh, um, this, uh, this particular slide, uh, I hate to admit it, uh, was inspired by uh, uh, John Delaney. Uh, back uh, 10, 15 years ago, when we both uh, served on the Ocean Observatory Steering Committee. And uh, John was showing his now famous uh, animation of uh, the underwater, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the bottom uh, f fish that were running around and uh, R2-D2s, uh, et cetera, he had in this movie. Uh, and I started thinking about how do we, how do we, con how do we actually make that work? And um, the, uh, the, the analogy in the air base system is the, the predator aircraft. You can sit in the United States somewhere and you can fly a plane as if you are sitting on the plane. You can fly it anywhere in the world. Uh, you don't have to be there. That would be nice, wouldn't it? And that's in what I have in this slide is really a trade-off of, of, um, uh, of the, various co the various components it takes to, uh, to make a, uh, uh, an underwater or a, a network system. So on the horizontal the x-axis, you have the, the, uh, um, the communication capacity. And uh, for the air, land and air-based networks, we're talking about 10 to the 12th uh, byte kilometer per minute. This, these are rough numbers. Um, the underwater world, in the other end, we're talking 10 to the 3rd. So we have 10 to the 9th, or a 9 order of magnitude uh, difference in communication capacity. Now, how do we solve that problem out there? Well, a submarine. What he does, and that's uh, the, the guy, the axis going into this slide, um, he has his sensors and he has his crew. He does not depend on talking to anybody for a month, if, it, if he has to be. He can be under the ice operating, achieving the mission objectives without, uh, um, without talking to anybody. Basically, and when he needs something, it's only a few bytes of information. It's basically the uh, nuclear firing codes. That's all he needs to get. And then he all, otherwise he's all set. So now that is what we are facing in, in our systems. So how do we get that? Because we don't have those cap the capability of putting these large sensors on these underwater vehicles. So we have to do something else. Well, basically what we have to do is we have to to, uh, to clone the, um, uh, the, uh, the captain, first of all. He's the one who makes the decision, has a situational awareness, et cetera, uh, what's going on around him, making sure that the vehicle is safe, et cetera. And then we have to have the user, and uh, let's not think about a submarine, uh, but a uh, research vessel. So it's a chief scientist. So the chief scientist has to work directly with the, um, uh, with the captain because the chief scientist is the one that is capable of doing environmental adaptation. He's the one who, if he's, if he's, if he's mapping an ocean front uh, that, uh, uh, that, can, um, that will have an understanding, okay, I have to do this and that, I have to go on this course to be able to find it, and then once we find it, we're gonna do this and that to track it. 
that we have to put in there. So we have to clone the captain and we have to clone the chief scientist and uh, put them in this, uh, uh, this, uh, this vehicle. And then we have to use the capabilities of the vehicle then to start moving around uh, just like we do with, the, uh, um, with our cell phones. If we don't have coverage somewhere, we'll walk over to the, to the window and uh, now, we have, uh, now we have coverage. So that's what I call intelligence autonomy and that's why I was saying earlier that you cannot do this without having the science, it has to be mission driven, which means that you have to have the scientist in there um, to, um, uh, to, to, be, to be able to put that intelligence, that, or that, uh, uh, that intelligent autonomy onto the vehicle that allow you to do adaptive sampling of coastal fronts, for instance, without wasting time being away from the, uh, uh, from the, uh, from the front. And uh, again, but John Delaney, uh, he obviously, we heard that this morning, he obviously was lobbying everybody and his brother to, to reference him, but I, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't avoid doing that, John. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, so that's why we have Henrik here to liven things up. Uh, <laughs> uh, Vincent, you you were nodding the whole time. Said so you were nodding. I, I assume in agreement. Uh, perhaps not. So what do you think? Uh, let, let's let's sort of. Uh, uh, Henrik uh, put up a, a vision there about how you make things more autonomous and you know what the important elements of that are from a practical perspective. You know, as a guy who has to worry about fielding vehicles. Uh, you know, you know. Ten years from now, if you're coming back and you're telling us uh, how you've got things organized, what, what have you changed? I think the confidence in the full autonomy is more and more uh, evident. Uh, a few years ago, we we were operated AUVs with a ship following the AUVs. Mm -hmm. Now we are operating AUVs with no ship, mm -hmm. and now we are operating several AUVs in the same time with no ship. Why? Because they are in full autonomy. And uh, the main problem for us is a communication problem. Uh, as it's difficult to tackle this problem, one of the way is to, to go to distributed or full autonomy, which is, I think, achievable for a simple task. Yeah, if yeah. a task is too complex, okay, here we have a deadlock, but for simple tasks, sur survey tasks mainly, I think full autonomy is ready. You know, we, can, we can run in full autonomy. Uh, for the other task, it's more complex, and we still remain to have communication uh, channel and communication things, but, and we have to distribute the intelligence between the ship and the, the visual of the AUV. So, so uh, we're getting close to opening the floor here for questions, but, but Michael, I know that you know, you're thinking about these, these questions presumably almost every day as you think about how you're gonna configure your, your organization. Um, no, I'm, well, yeah. <laughs> coming, coming to this autonomy stuff. What, oh, no, what not, not autonomy, actually. Let me take you back to, to uh, again, you know, we're coming back 10 years from now. Uh, do we have the same, you know, do, are the ships the same? You know, are, yeah. are, are facilities the same? Or are things, have things changed? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what uh, what I, I hope is that the, the, the costs of these instruments will, will decrease in the coming years. And uh, I have told you that earlier, um, there was a kind of funny command of a colleague of mine in, in, in Germany recently, he, he said, well, let's wait until the Chinese or India are stepping into the market of uh, produ producing AUVs and, and uh, ROVs. Then they become so cheap, then it doesn't matter anyhow if we lose one sending them into the fish and wind shelf as in the Antarctic Weddell Sea, for instance. Um, I, I, I hope that this is not the necessity that, that China and India has to step in first, but that other companies also in Europe and in, in the US and elsewhere can afford it to, to produce these systems more, more cheaper, first of all, more reliable. And if we lose one, I, I remember the, the awful accident happening to Knox in, uh, almost eight or 10 years ago, losing their prototype Autosub in the Antarctic under the shelf ice by a very stupid mistake the system has done. Um, just releasing its ballast weight uh, under the chair vice, which is the worst thing you can imagine. Um, uh, I, I guess the, the new systems will become cheaper, more reliable, and more autonomously, as, as Vincent just said. That is uh, the expectation for the coming decade, and that they will work in, as I mentioned earlier, these, these social insects behavior in swarms, helping each other, this kind of sharing workloads which we have invented almost 2,000 years or so ago, or earlier. 
Any quick comments here before we to open the floor? Yeah, just really quick. I think what I mentioned earlier about the AEV market starting to kind of segment itself into very different applications, I think that will kind of fall in with, with what you, you want is the cheaper AEVs. Right now, a single platform having to serve many masters means we put in a lot of stuff that may be unnecessary or redundant for a particular user. Um, you know, we've got stuff in there. It has to serve the military. Well, it also has to serve academia. And so that we have to kind of make up a price point in between there to make both both sides happy. Um, I think if, if the technology starts to diverge, and again, you get the academic AEVs that look absolutely nothing and act absolutely nothing like the military AEVs, then you can finally get the dedicated design and the, the different price points more appropriate to each of those markets. Great. So let's open the floor here to questions. Uh, Ajit Subramaniam, GBMF. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is, we've kind of been dancing around the needle just a wee bit on the communications end, and I'm curious to know, just as you asked before, what's the next big thing and what folks have in their back pockets. I'm curious to know what people are working on for communications. After all, Iridium is an accident, is a happy accident that has happened to us. It has served us well, but you know, what's next on that? And the second question, perhaps um, especially to our foreign colleagues, I'm curious to know what they, their experiences has been with unmanned aerial vehicles. What kind of legal issues they've been dealing with and you know, where they are with all of those. Oh, yeah. Thanks. So anyone want to uh, jump on that first one? I'll, I'll say a few words on the communication that you had on that uh, horizontal axis on the slide. Uh, the, uh, the big bottleneck is the... Uh, um, in terms of bandwidth is your underwater communication. And I said, uh, we, the number we're using for designing our systems, whether in deep water or the, on shallow water, is uh, 100 bytes a minute is what we have to work with. Point to point, nothing more than that. So all you can afford is to send uh, relatively uh, simple commands down and you can get a, a few status reports or, uh, uh, state or contact reports or whatever you want to get, uh, to, to get back to the, uh, to the surface. In terms of the getting to the surface, once you get above the surface, of course, RF is uh, going to help you a lot. And Iridium is, is being used with wave gliders as, uh, um, as uh, gateways uh, connecting to the, from the underwater world to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, um, uh, to the satellites. Um, but again, the prob one of the problems is that the vehicle has to be able to talk to the wave glider. Um, depending on where it is, and uh, the latencies, we typically, that number we typically are using for designing these systems is about 30 minutes of latency. So in order to get back to the operators and do something adaptively in, with the operator in the loop or the scientists sitting on shore in the loop, we're talking about things that happen on an hourly basis. Things that are having more events that are more rapid than that uh, is going to be facing that communication. And the underwater communication has been worked on for 20, 30 years. All they're getting is maybe a decade, maybe one order of magnitude. It's physics that is the limiting factor in that. We'll say that, you know, I, I would actually just comment there is no silver bullet there, but there's a lot of ways of sort of kludging together different solutions. So one, for example, that we're doing with our underwater vehicles is the vehicle surfaces, dumps its data to an autonomous uh, surface platform, uh, and then goes back down while the autonomous platform sends things back through the soda straw pipe. So, so, you know, I don't, I don't think there's any, you know, until somebody puts up a good satellite system or we get enough power to really power a directional antenna, you're kind of stuck with, you're kind of stuck with what you have. I, I'd like to make sure we get time for your, the second part of your question. So, uh, our European colleagues, uh, uh, you guys want to? On communication or on air? Uh, air. Air. Perhaps if you want to uh, talk about no, air. I have no experience with uh, air. Yeah, Michael, do you? Uh, I could tell you an anecdote about unmanned aerial vehicles in, in Germany. The German defense minister just struggled about this, this issue because he has ordered uh, for 650 million euros uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles in the U.S. without uh, recognizing beforehand that there are German laws in force which do not allow to, to use these unmanned aerial vehicles in the German uh, area uh, in the German in, in Germany. So uh, it, there's no permission to use them. We have very strict regulations in, in Germany and in other uh, European countries uh, concerning these unmanned aerial vehicles. 
but I see a, a huge potential for them for, for, in, for example, for uh, measuring the ice thickness in the Arctic using electromagnetic uh, probes uh, on board of these unmanned air vehicles. We do it actually with helicopters mainly uh, based on, on research vessels. Uh, but these unmanned systems could be a, an excellent tool for, for ground truthing of ice thickness uh, for these uh, cryosat, for instance, satellite measurements. So next, next question. I'm Kim Juniper with Ocean Networks Canada. I want to come back to a point that was discussed at the beginning of the panel, which is describing the development process where various panelists described this as a process by which scientists identified a measurement that they wanted to make. It was translated into requirements, which eventually came to the engineers who solved the problem. That, that's kind of a boring approach to this, and, and it doesn't really leave much room for creativity in the engineering world. And I. You know, in one of the earlier panels, we, we talked about how some of the big advances are made when there are unusual adoptions of technologies that were developed for something else, and suddenly, they, oh, I could use that to do this. So what if we just let the engineers take over for a while? Um, okay. God help us all. Um, <laughs> Um, well, I think um, I think a lot of interesting things could come out of that, particularly, as I mentioned, you're getting a lot of people coming into the workforce now who already have, you know, what they feel, maybe, maybe not, is, is really a, a good basis of what, what the basics are out there, right? They know about torpedo-shaped AUVs, and they know about making things watertight and pressure tolerant. But, you know, at uni, they also worked on, you know, crazy manipulators and fancy vision slam systems and, and that sort of thing. And I think as those people come in, they're going to be asking the same question, saying, well, this is boring. Why can't we do this? Why can't we do this? Why can't we do this? So I think that influence is going to start pushing things in a more interesting direction. Excellent. Vincent, did you want to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think we have also this process of uh, crazy idea from uh, engineering getting... Uh, well explained to scientists, and uh, <laughs> there is a feedback in this case. But in fact, I, I got the, uh, the institutional way, and then, and well, well, that's the reason why I present this uh, like this. But uh, it's true, uh, innovation is coming also from the engineer, engineer proposing new, new, new deal to scientists. Good. So, do we have a, another? Uh, do you have one more here? Hello, um, Leighton Raleigh oh. again. Um, one of the questions I've got, we were saying about um, purpose-built vehicles. Do you uh, foresee there being a slowdown in academia, for example, due to funding? I mean, funding is being shelved in a lot of places mm. so that we will end up using these like standard industry vehicles because um, the funding's been cut. They don't want to put the investment, the time that it takes when they can say, I can go out and buy a an AUV off the shelf. It's got off-the-shelf parts. It costs one million dollars, or I can pay these guys to sit around in a room for three years and come up with something and program this. Do you think there'll be a stall in a lot of institutes saying, why should I invest in this? I can just send these people on a course to, to use it. Do you think there will be a stall there? Um, well, I, I think one of, one of the things that, uh, that you have to look into is to really to, to look at multi-use of these platforms. You have to have platforms that are generic enough, and you can buy relatively cheap uh, um, relatively cheap underwater vehicles, uh, order of magnitude 50K. They don't have much on them. But then you can have the, the scientists, the various scientists doing various missions in the ocean. You can have them put in software. Basically, nowadays, you take a gumsticks uh, computer. We run 21-inch vehicles with, a, uh, the, uh, uh, with the, what we call the payload autonomy, uh, the captain and the chief scientist, on a gumsticks computer that plugs into a USB connection on a, an off-the-shelf vehicle, and that basically takes over the vehicle and runs it, uses all the sensors, etc., and you can use it for frontal mapping, you can use it for acoustic measurements, whatever you want to do. So I think the multi-use of the vehicles, but that all comes back down to having this modularity of the software and getting, having the scientist directly develop the software uh, that he wants to do for, for, the, for the mission he's interested in. So, Mike, Michael? Keyword, uh, multi-use of these, of these systems. 
what I have seen the last 10 years, uh, I, I, I'm speaking for Germany now, <laughs> is that uh, institutes were kind of proud to have bought one or two of these systems. And they were very, very dedicated for single missions uh, in, 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 in the early beginning. And the downtime of these systems were so extremely high that it was really a mess to spend so much money into, the, into these, these systems. That is really a backstroke, I would say. We, in Sweden, we have just uh, submitted a proposal to the Swedish Research Council. Uh, it's called Swedish Marine Research Infrastructure Consortium. That is an agreement of the five leading Swedish universities together with the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute to grant access to all our infrastructure we can provide for the marine research to all Swedish and external users on a, in an open and transparent mode of, uh, of application with peer-reviewed uh, project proposals. And according to the scientific merit of these proposals, they have then access on all the infrastructure, starting from research vessels down to temperature-controlled laboratories in the various stations we have at the west and east coast of Sweden. That is, for our, in our opinion, the, the, the way to really justify the, the costly <coughs> infrastructure we provide to the research community in Sweden and to external users. And I, what I've heard here is that in, in the U.S. The, the, the planning of the research vessels is made in a very similar way to that. So, so uh, I'm not going to have everybody answer every question here, so why don't we move to just to get as many questions out. So I'm sorry. Uh, yes. I, yeah, I got uh, one Campbell. more. Um, I'm wondering what's on the horizon for these new toys you guys are making. Mm. Is, have, have you thought about uh, unmanned aerial vehicle uh, AUV combination or or gliders, one, uh, a system that can fly out to an ocean area, drop under the water, do its mission, and then Ooh. fly back home. Wow. Uh, oh, actually, I, interestingly, there was a DARPA solicitation on that. So do you, yeah, yeah, I mean that that sort of concept has definitely been out there. Um, I think. Uh, you know, especially the UAVs really seem to be a much more mature technology. They're better understood the operations and everything. And I think, you know, not just the people who are in working in subsea robotics and ocean science, you know, thinking outside the box coming up with these. It's people who already know about AUV saying, right, I want one of those swimming things, but all I really know is, a is UAV, so can I make it like that? Um, so I think that those two sides are starting to push the envelope a little bit in an interesting way. There was a, there was a, I think there may be the one you're talking about, but there was a concept of a, a, something that looked like a cruise missile that would actually dive into the ocean and become a glider. Yeah, I, think I think I've also seen the other direction, too, that it starts as an AUV and then can take off. Yeah, I, I mean, I will just comment that, that a number of the surface craft, uh, the wave glider, the sail drone, uh, I don't know about the, uh, I can't remember the name of it, uh, Gwen, Gwen Griffith's latest vehicle. They're all kind of out of left field. They're, they're not from sort of, you know, the traditional lab. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff going. Uh, Beth Orcutt from the Bigelow Laboratory. Oh, um, this has been a really interesting conversation about everything that requires no person in it. Um, but I think there's actually assets out there too that we haven't really talked about in the session. The new Alvin upgrade, uh, you know, James Cameron designing his own submarine to go to the bottom of the ocean and, and the other people involved in that challenge. Um, and also commercial interests that are designing, you know, little one person, uh, human occupied vehicles so that a person could go into the ocean if they want to off of their great yacht or something. Um, and I'd like to hear from you guys, obviously you're coming more from maybe the robotic side, but what do you see as kind of the new cutting edge frontier for manned um, exploration of the seafloor and how can we bring in things like telepresence and other things to that atmosphere? So that's a, that's a Vincent question since he operates a manned vehicle, a human occupied vehicle. I'm, I'm mainly an expert of deep sea and managed submersible. Not, uh, all, it's not all the managed submersible, we have a lot of uh, other places. There is a, a new interest for managed submersible in the world. Um, it's mainly due to uh, flagship reasons, political reasons, because it's less expensive to have a managed submersible to put a, a flag on a, an area for mineral permits than to launch people on March. So now we have Chinese, we will have uh, uh, Indian soon, Korean perhaps soon. So the interest of managed submersible is exactly the same uh, interest to have man on moon and man on, on March. Uh, I have a discussion with a guy from NASA recently and he's a geologist from NASA and he explained me um, 
her man on March will do the job of curiosity since one year in one hour. The problem is to, 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 to have this guy on March. But in, in terms of efficiency, to have a man here, it's, uh, it's still interesting to have it. The main problem is the cost. The main problem is uh, how many men to go in the, in the productivity at the end. Um, we still operate no-till in, in my institution, but uh, no-till is, uh, uh, for us, it's very dimensioning because we need a big ship to deploy the system. Uh, we have a security uh, aspect, regulation, which add cost uh, to, to the operation. And uh, recently we saved no-till just uh, organi organizing our uh, crews differently. No-till is diving during the day and the AUV during the night then the ship is fully occupied. But that's the way we, we use to, to save the man, the man at submersible. Uh, the other reasons uh, to have men uh, on, on site, it's, uh, <laughs> it's very difficult to say. Free division, uh, the intuition, uh, I have no real, uh, real uh, uh, reason for that. So, so actually, actually uh, if you don't mind, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, kind of violate the rules here. Andy, I just got Andy, Andy Bow in a microphone. We were having a really interesting discussion, actually, at dinner last night uh, about a lot of these things. And Andy, can you talk a little bit about the difference between uh, the Cameron vehicle, uh, you know, getting something through the NAVC process, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and the realities of the human-occupied vehicle? Yeah, I, I, I'm ha happy to. I mean, I, I, uh, I think, you know, this is a debate, of course, that has uh, raged for a good long time in terms of the, uh, the relative merits of uh, robotic exploration versus human exploration. And uh, as James, Cam James Cameron's fond of saying, you know, nobody ever grew up wanting to be a robot. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and while it's difficult to sort of quantify or monetize the idea of exploring the ocean with a, uh, you know, one versus the other. I think it is uh, pretty important to acknowledge the fact that humans exploring physically the environment is uh, a, a tremendous mechanism by which it actually engages everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether that uh, uh, has a sufficient value to offset what are clearly challenges of sustaining human life in a harsh but, but, environment. But Andy, Andy, why didn't you all build Cameron's vehicle then? Uh, well, because we built a six or 11 kilometer robot to do the job earlier. Right. <laughs> uh, so okay, that was and, a matter but there's, of a, there's another reason too, and perhaps Su Susan should uh, uh, comment on this. Um. What, what did you want me to comment on? <laughs> yeah. I think what we want to do here is understand sort of what some of the constraints are on, on uh, you know, why could Cameron do this? I mean, it was a really impressive feat. I don't know about anyone else, but yeah. I was following that. I was glued to the web, right, sort of paying attention to whether he showed up. But, yeah. but, there, but, but he could do things that the rest of us can't do, right? Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, first of all, he didn't have to build um, a submarine that was going to be certified for operational use on a day-to-day -day basis with certain saf safety standards. He was able, what he did though was miraculous because he was able to hire an engineering team from different parts of the world who thought outside the box, who never one of them, never had, had worked in the, in the water before. And so it kind of freed their imagination both in terms of what was the vehicle supposed to do uh, and versus what we would have to do as an operations operator of um, a human-occupied submarine um, down in the water. So, uh, you know, Andy's right. There was, there's a lot of technology that went into that um, vehicle, a new innovative technology that went into Jim Cameron's vehicle, Deep Sea Challenger, that can be used now um, in robotic applications as well as uh, human-occupied um, vehicles um, for the future. And, and we can learn a lot from that. And I think it illustrates some of the value of a, a public-private partnership mm -hmm. um, in new ways um, that we haven't been able to explore before and, and things w that we have to take advantage of. So, uh, but ultimately, we had to um, build a vehicle that was going to pass the NAVC certification process and be able to operate 400, 4,000, 5,000 dives, you know, in, into the future. So, so I think we, we have time for one last question, is that right? And uh, I think Tim Schenk uh, yeah. gets it. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, there are many of us uh, scientists who uh, want to address questions that over a long spatial scale 
and you didn't really mention anything about long-range AUVs, the current uh -huh. status, and, the, and whether you're going with those things. I'd like to hear something about that, what the current challenges, is, challenges are, or what, what's going to make it happen, and how soon. Um, yeah, so, uh, so, so for those of you who don't know, uh, one, of the, one of the things that, that we've been working on in my lab are, are vehicles which are propeller-driven vehicles. Now, first of all, there are long-range AUVs that exist, right? We call them gliders, so there's buoyancy-driven systems, and they're really impressive systems, and they have crossed the Atlantic. Um, but uh, they don't have much in the way of payload, and they don't go very fast, and they're constrained to a particular flight profile, which is very useful for some things, but doesn't let you do things like, for example, mapping under ice or so on. So I, I think the story is, and I'll talk about this a bit this evening, uh, is, uh, is that you can do a lot uh, in when you make another run at this technology, you know, the, our first round of, of building vehicles is because they did have to kind of do everything. They weren't tuned for anything, right? Uh, they were kind of kind of compromises at a lot of in a lot of things. And when you really sort of sit down and sharpen your pencil, you can make things that that run a lot, you run a lot longer underwater. And uh, and they really do, I think, change your operational paradigm. And they get into this communication problem because now communications really becomes the bottleneck of how you how you do them. So uh, I, I uh, Victor, uh, Victor, it's up to Victor. What a fascinating panel. I'd like to thank all of our panel participants and Dr. Jim Bellingham for this wonderful, wonderful discussion, performing so much energy. Great. It's incredible. Thank you so Great much. Great job. We will have a coffee break and would like to welcome